Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Amen. Let's bless the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Jesus, we give you honor and glory tonight, God. We praise you, God. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us. We thank you, Lord, for your mercy, your hand of protection, that you're Jehovah Jireh, that you're my provider tonight, God. You're my redeemer tonight, God. You're my savior, my creator, and I give you praise tonight from my heart. I bless the name of the Lord Jesus in my soul, God, for you are great tonight, and you are greatly to be praised. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. I want to sing that again. Sing it again. Open the eyes. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. To see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing, Holy, Holy, Holy. High and lifted up, oh, you're shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing. Holy, sing that chorus again. To see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing. Oh, say it one more time. Oh, to see you high and lifted up, oh, shining in the light of your glory. Holy, holy, holy. Oh, shine in the eyes of your glory. Lord, pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy to see you high. Shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. Tell them that tonight. You're holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. I want to see you. Say it one more time.
Jesus, we want to see you, God. You said you're coming back, God. Help our hearts and our souls and our spirits to be prepared for you, God. Have our minds set on you to awaken every day, Lord, with an expectation of faith in our soul today, God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Thank you, singers. I want to say a couple things about what's going on with Israel. We're teaching on something different, but with it being so relevant and what's taking place in the news, our country, we've already put a battleship group or, or uh, aircraft carrier group in with ships. There's like they said, six to ten out there. We have another group that's leaving Virginia going and since Sunday, we found out there's a lot more uh, Americans that were either killed or taken hostage. I'll wait till God stops talking there and laughing. <laughs> and so we don't know where this goes, but I, I w I'll say this, that in my entire life, In my entire life, uh, we've never had this happen, except you go back to 1973. And uh, so this is, this is relevant, this matters. And another reason it matters is, of course, isn't it funny in 2023, just like it has for thousands of years in this book, it revolves around what? Israel. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? That tiny little country, the world news revolves around Israel. So wh why does Israel matter so much? Well, the time clock of Jesus Christ is not based on America, and it's not based on any other nation in Scripture. But the time clock of the Lord's coming all revolves around the nation of Israel. It's based on what's happening in Israel. And when Jesus Christ in the Word of God says he returns, he's not returning to the United States. He's returning to Israel, the Mount of Olives. And the Bible says that he'll go through the Eastern Gate. If you know anything about the Eastern Gate, it's been sealed off. It's 16 feet thick of cement. And in front of the Eastern Gate, they have put a cemetery where dead people are. And in Jewish custom and law, you, if you go through where, if you touch dead people, go through that, you're considered unclean. Therefore, you cannot go into the holy place. And so it's amazing, of course, in Scripture that the Lord decided, well, that's where I'm going. <laughs> I'm going into Israel, to the Mount of Olives, and then to the Eastern Gate. And the Bible says that he's going to come, he's going to rule, he's going to reign for a thousand years, and there's going to be a final battle that's not fought in the United States of America but it's fought in the land of Israel. It's fought in a place called Megiddo, the Valley of Megiddo. If you want to see what that looks like, you can Google that. Just Google the Valley of Megiddo, and you'll see it. And that's where the scriptures teach. And so right now, with all that's going on, the scripture says this, this is Zechariah 2 and 8, that when you touch Israel, you touch the apple of God's eye. And then Genesis 12 and 3, the promise to Abraham, the father of Israel. I will bless those that bless you. I will curse those that curse you. And in Psalm 122, the Bible commands us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem in Israel. And so there's a great relevance to, first of all, what events take place there. That's why we talk about it. We pay attention to it. Let me add something else about all this. How many have paid attention to all the college campuses who are having rallies that are pro for Hamas in Palestine. Here's the problem. Yes, we should care also about the Palestinian people. We should care because there's probably a lot of civilians there who do not want to be led by Hamas. 
I bet there's a lot that, that are a part of that too, though. But there's a lot, I'm sure, in millions of people that live there, a few million that do not. But here's the problem with, and this, this is a undergirding problem of our whole country, is these college age students go to Harvard and these type of universities, and they are indoctrinated. Everyone hearing me? Because we're talking about doctrine tonight in the teaching. They are indoctrinated with teachings that come from professors who are anti-God, number one. They're anti-God. So when it comes to all these other things that we talk about before this took place, that's the foundation is they're anti-God. But when you, when you delve deeper into what's taking place, they rationalize and say, well, Israel is an occupier. And Israel, it's also important that the women and children and the people of Palestine not be killed and destroyed. Here's the huge difference. Listen, huge difference. Israel has never, ever gone into Palestinian homes and slit babies' throats, decapitated their heads, killed their mothers and their fathers. One woman was killed with her baby coming out and the umbilical cord is still attached. I mean, I, it's unbelievable how grotesque it is. And taking innocent people who have nothing to do with war or fighting or anything. Israel, that's why we call Hamas a terrorist group. Because they bring terror. Remember ISIS, just like ISIS did. And so, why in America we have a generation of young people who are so biased against truth that their discernment is lacking because they always side on the anti-God side. If you, on every issue, on every issue, they slide on the anti-God slide. Those same ones though, they won't say a word about a baby who's eight months and three weeks in a mother's womb and in some states you can take and commit murder, is what we call it, they call it abortion. You can commit murder on that baby and it's considered legal, and they won't say a word about that. They'll make all these issues about women being abused and raped in America the uh, last couple years with the, the Me Too movement, but then when Israeli women are being taken off and raped, and there's no women's rights being talked about by these groups now. How many see what I'm talking about? There's such a drastic difference between the two. And so that's why we are so pro-Israel, according to the scripture. And then you just got to use common sense. Here's what I really believe. We have a generation that is blinded by spirits. And that's all Bible. That's what I really believe. These young people in these colleges that are going today, it was a huge rally day on behalf. I saw females with passion. They really believe what they're saying. With passion. Not for the Palestinians, for the Hamas. For the ones that slit the baby's throats and cut their heads off. And there's one picture they showed, and I'm sorry to be so grotesque, but it's just the truth, and it would help people to understand how vile this is. There's a pool of blood in the baby's crib from it. And yet, she passionately, not for Palestinian women and children, no, for these men who did such vile, vulgar things. So that's why we pray for Israel, the peace of Israel, and as my point of view as your pastor standing here tonight is I am all for Israel defending themselves, protecting themselves, and uprooting those vile, vulgar people who did this to their nation. You have a right to defend your family. You have a right to defend your home. There, there's heroic stories that have come out of one of the kibitzes had no deaths because a 23-year-old army young lady, she went and unlocked the armory and guns were given out and they were put in strategic positions so that when the terrorists came, when she realized what was going on, and the terrorists came into their kibbutz, she was prepared, as all of them were in different positions, that they ambushed the terrorists. They killed 20-something 
and the rest, they, they went away, they defended, no one died. Whereas, of course, in others where they could not defend themselves, they were slaughtered like animals. And so we, uh, we want to always remember to do what the Scripture says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. But when you have people like that doing things like that, and they can lay silent for years and then rise up and plan. Um, I just i am saying these things because we have young people in this church. And I know we're, we're, we're low in attendance and missing some folk, but you young people that are here tonight, you, you teenagers, you 20-somethings, you need to stand for the things of God and not get these college campuses that are teaching this vulgar, vile, and these kids who are your ages, some of you, and they're going up and having rallies, and they're pro these things that are so wrong that their discernment is so lacking. I am so concerned for America. I am so concerned for America that we have come to this place, and we have some people in Congress who need their butts voted out, not because they're Democrat or Republican or Independent or what's the other one? There's another one, whatever. No, no, not because of none of that but because they're vile, they're vulgar, and they're anti-God. I mean, they're vulgar anti-God. And there's some people that are just anti-God, but I'm talking about they are vulgar and vilely anti-God. And our nation's in trouble when our lawmakers are atheistic, they're anti-Christian, anti-God. That puts a country in trouble. You get too many people like that in your leadership. And with the campuses of our colleges being filled with so many young people who are clueless and lacking discernment, I'm concerned where this country ends up in the next number of years. If the Lord tarries his coming, boy, it's scary, ain't it? It's scary. And we have to be cognizant of that. That's why I'm talking about it right now. We have to have discernment of that. And use that go to high school and colleges you got to have some guts and courage to stand against the majority. I, in 1980s and early 90s, I even dealt with that in college. And I was ridiculed in college and laughed at by professor, students, because I would, even back then, and I would stand for God. Some of y'all, when you get in these situations, do not be Shadrach be uh, Abednego, be Meshach, be Daniel. Stand for God. Don't bow your knee to that pressure. Don't be afraid to speak up, and when you do, understand you're hated for his namesake. But young people, understand that's part of the price of living for Jesus in this generation. And so I encourage you and I challenge you to do that. And don't be silent. Speak for what's right. There's got to be a voice in your generation. All of you teens and you 20-somethings that are here tonight, if you're watching at home and you're not here but you're at home watching, there's got to be some 20-somethings and teens who are going to speak out for God and for what's written in this book and the principles that the country was founded upon. And if you're silent, who is going to speak? Amen. All right. I hope you heard and learned a little bit there tonight in that. Amen. I want to share something else. And when I share this, uh, I'm sharing this because of two reasons. I was so humbled by it. Um, could somebody, this, I'm going to have an epileptic spell. See these lights flashing? Find the one that is controlling that and turn it a little bit one way or the other. But I can't do a whole service with that going on. Yeah, find the one for his. And then. I received an email, and I want to share it because, number one, it was a huge encouragement to my life today. I received it today. And it's impossible for anybody watching this online or any of you sitting here to fully understand why I feel so moved by this email. But me and my wife, of course, do. And my mom and my dad. And then secondly, 
there's a great power in your words. And either a text, an email, a phone call. In fact, the Bible talks about that. And it says, when those words are aptly spoken. In other words, when they're spoken at the right time. You know what the Bible says about that? The Bible says, it's like a cool drink of water in a desert. Can you imagine that? I mean, think of the time where you were as thirsty as you could have been and, boy, that cold drink of water. The Bible says that's how our words can be. And, and so that's another reason I want to share this, to show that I'm not reading it to make myself look great because it, it speaks to my life and to me. So don't misunderstand my motive, but I want to teach those two things from it tonight about that. And this man is a bishop of a mega church in America. It's in the Chicago area. And it would be considered a mega church. He's on television all the time. He's preaching a camp meeting right now, travels the country. Someone that my father knew before when I was a little kid, and then he's older than I am. And then uh, I knew him for most of my life. And many years ago, he ministered to me and my wife. And so I have not heard from him in over 20 years. But he writes to me today, hey, Pastor Scott, just thought about you and thought you should know I think you're the greatest, and I pray for you all the time. You are a true hero to never give up after the hell you went through. And he put in the word hell about 10 L's, which I found funny. I bless you forever for that example and thought you should know how I feel. I pray your parents are great, and I travel almost every week at this point with television and etc. May the Lord bless and keep you and your family. Just think that sometimes we think of positive things and don't say them. I am preaching a camp meeting and just thought Pastor Scott should know he's one of my heroes. A little smiley. Bless you, Dan Willis. Isn't that beautiful? But the point I want you to get out of that, just think that sometimes we think it with positive things and we don't say them. I was very moved today and my wife because of, of his influence to us many years ago and then him just saying those things to us because of who he is. I don't mean this wrong, but in the world of church and all that, I would be like a little peon compared to what he's doing and who he knows and where he's exposed. So for him to take the time to think about me and to email me, I, I just thought was incredible. But the principle out of this and the lesson is there's a lot of negativity in our world. Let's follow the example he gave to me today in that emails, text, words can really encourage somebody. Amen? Even family members, even in marriages, things like that. And so let's all work harder at that to really minister to somebody. And I sent him back an email and told him how he ministered to me and today and how humbled I was and moved in touch. And so I thank God for that today uh, in my life. A couple more things. I uh, spoke with a, a few different ministers today. Uh, we're actually texting, not actually talking, but Brother Andrew Suarez, they'll be arriving tomorrow. And so we look forward this Sunday, he'll be in church preaching Sunday morning and then Sunday night after church, or Sunday night rather, at 6 p.m. in our Spanish service. And then a week from tonight, next Thursday, he's here again preaching. He'll have his wife with him and he'll have his two boys with him. So it's going to be fun. We look forward to them being with us. Now what we want to do, because we have the Spanish service Sunday night, is all of the youth, when you go to youth class, what we want you to do when you're dismissed tonight is we want you to go in the middle room where all these chairs are, all these types of chairs. And all you youth, we want you to help bring all those chairs out that door, through that door. And uh, Brother Jose, go stand right in the middle back there. Brother Jose, go stand right in the middle back there. Yeah, there you go. See where Brother Jose is? What we want to do, we want to keep aisles on the left, 
and we want to keep aisles on the right, but we want to put uh, a whole section of chairs right there. Young people, you see what I'm talking about? Where Brother Jose is. So you just want to do, just like you have rows here, um, just do, keep doing rows. And uh, I don't know how many chairs we got exactly over there. And that way, uh, Sunday morning, we don't have to worry about it after church. And we'll have it done tonight. Amen. And then next uh, Friday, not, not this coming Friday, is it, where's Brittany? Is it the next Friday or, or is it two more? Yeah, it is. So next Friday is the youth event, Fear Factor. And so 6.30, all the youth that need, that need a ride, if you don't need a ride, uh, you can just go straight there. We'll have the address in the bulletin Sunday uh, before. But if you do need a ride, we'll have the church van available for any youth that want to go on the church van from here. And so we'll, we'll have all that ready for you this Sunday about uh, address and all that. That starts at 7 over there. Any parents, if you do drop youth off here at the church, you would want to pick them up at 10 p.m. That's the time that they would be ready back here would be around 10 p.m. If something changed, we would just text about that. So remember that. So a lot of good things going on, amen? A lot of exciting things going on. Let me make sure I'm not missing nothing here. All right, let's stand. Oh, I am forgetting something. Please, if you have not yet done so, we'll do it again this Sunday too, but if you have not yet done so, our first sheet for the dinner is pretty much full. I put a second sheet out there. Anybody here, you know, we would love for everybody, by the way. We would love for everybody to stay Saturday night on the anniversary weekend and stay for the dinner. It's free. It's for everybody. We're going to have a great time. Uh, but if you know you're going to stay for the dinner, we need you to sign up that sign-up sheet because after Sunday, um, or actually it'll be the next Sunday, but after that, because we're having to purchase, buy, set up, prepare. So please do so. And we'll appreciate that. Put your name of you or your family, how many are coming and, uh, with you. And that way we can have a really good number because our guests that come from out of town, we know some that are for sure coming. Pastor Israel and his family will come. Charity and her new husband will be here. So Stefan. So some of you, Charity is Pastor Israel's daughter who got married this year. So her husband will be here as well. I believe, Bishop, is that correct? Okay, I thought so. They'll be here. The Matenzi family who worked in ministry in this church at Goshio Road will be here. Um, we will have Pastor Shine will be here. Uh, Pastor Rodriguez's family will be here. Pastor Blevins uh, and some of them will be here. Uh, there'll be a number of people coming, but we don't know exactly how many. I've talked with Eduardo and Brandy, uh, Bruce and Jessica in North Carolina, uh, the others in Mississippi. So there some people talked about trying to come. So we're kind of uncertain on that number. So if we get a good solid number on a ballpark way from our own group, it gives us an idea how to prepare. So please sign up. We'll appreciate that. Ushers can come, and we'll worship in giving Thursday night, offering, tithe, and offering. Uh, we want to say thank you to everybody who gave Sunday towards the Spanish uh, food uh, for the Sunday night dinner after the service this Sunday night. Uh, we were, Brother Angel said he thought from their numbers they need about $500, and we raised $485. Let's give a hand clap for that. Amen. <laughs> so that, that took care of the need for, for that. Uh, one unfortunate thing to report is yesterday we had, uh, or Tuesday, we had an air conditioning man here because after the power had went out, our air conditioner would not work over there. And he couldn't fix it and said an electrician had to come. So the electrician was here all the way till almost 11 o'clock last night. And what the story was, was the whole building could have burnt down. Because we have an old Challenger system as our board in there. And it blew and fried the system part for the air conditioner. And so we're, we're blessed that it didn't burn down. And then secondly, um, he had to come and replace all of that, which the whole thing cost us about $3,500, unfortunately. Uh, but we had that take place. But I went in there uh, today, and the air conditioner is working. So praise the Lord for that anyway, because it can always be worse. So we're glad it's not. 
Amen. For those who say, pray for us. Amen. If you have something to give, march with it as the music plays. going to dismiss uh, all of our teens to all those in youth class 11 and up. Uh, now, here's what we're also going to do. Unfortunately, Desiree had to have wisdom tooth surgery, and so Sister Tanya was not able to come and be here because of that. And boy, if anyone's had that, that's not fun at all for Desi, of course. So, we don't have a class uh, for the kids, but uh, anyone that, uh, we only got a few kids below that age, but you're welcome to go to youth class tonight. So if Sammy wants to go to youth class, and that, they can go sit in youth class with the big kids. It's up to, up to the parents because it's either here or there. So we'll dismiss out the back door, our youth class at this time, and they'll have a good time. Everyone else can be seated. And Olivia, 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 can you go to the PowerPoint and set that up before, for me? Just activate number four. And once you do that, I can control it up here. If you're online, we welcome you to go along with us here as we keep on teaching about truth and doctrine from last week. Yeah, just the file folder for today's service, number four. You can X that whole thing out. The service, file folder, the date of today's service. There you go. Thank you. So last week we introduced about being, uh, being aware of false teachers. In fact, you know the Bible teaches there's 13 things in Scripture to be aware of. 13 things the Bible says be aware of. One of them, by the way, is beware of dogs. <laughs> of course, it's not talking about pit bulls. It's symbolic. But it does say that. It says beware of dogs. Beware of false prophets. Beware of the religious. That's interesting. Beware of religious doctrine. This is all in the New Testament. Beware of covetousness. Always want more of something. Never satisfied, never content. Beware of evil workers. Beware that you're not led away with the error of the wicked. Beware of surfeiting. By the way, that's not surfing on the waves of California in the Pacific Ocean, but it's excess eating and drinking. In other words, if you go into that, it's beware of being consumed with carnal appetites is what that's talking about. Beware of drunkenness. That's why we just draw a line on alcohol. I don't have a scripture that says you're sinning if you have a drink of alcohol, but I've got scripture plenty that says you're sinning if you're drunk. So I have two questions when it comes to alcohol. At what point does God say you're drunk and you've sinned and you're going to hell? I'm not risking that. Where is that line? Right? Right? Secondarily, all you need is common sense on that one. Alcohol has destroyed so many people, so many families, personal to me even. So it's just a line we draw. There's 75 verses that talk about that, two of them in a positive sense, 
And the alcohol of Scripture is much different than the alcohol of today, by the way. And 73 of them basically say this about alcohol. Watch out. Beware. Stay away from it. Amen, somebody? Beware of the cares of this life. Wow. Beware of the cares of this life. Beware you don't get spoiled. I, I love this one because what I said earlier about our college campuses. Beware you don't get spoiled through philosophy. That's what's going on on college campuses right now. Beware you don't get spoiled through vain deceit. And that's what's going on, deception. Vain deception. In other words, teaching on things that are deceiving because they profit nothing with God or for eternity. Two more. Beware of the tradition of men. We'll talk about that tonight. And beware of the rudiments of this world. The word rudiments there simply means the principles or the ideologies of this world. Beware of the principles. Beware of the ideologies of this world. So we taught last week about being aware, and we talked about sound doctrine. And so we asked the question last week, how important is doctrine? Or does doctrine matter? And you all received a note sheet last week. If you, if you didn't get one, if you weren't here, I've got, I'll put them on the altar. I've got extra copies, so when church is over, you want to get a copy, there they are. And you, it's front and back of the sheet, and it's a great layout. And we talked in those scriptures about truth and doctrine. And our fundamental foundational scripture for understanding what is truth is 2 Corinthians 4.13. I accidentally put 4.11, but it's 4.13. And it's we having the same spirit of faith according as it is written, we believed, and therefore we speak. And so we said, hey, when we understand what truth and doctrine is, it always starts with what is written in the Bible. Amen, church. It never starts with I think. It never starts with I feel. It always starts with God's Word says. And then we add experiences to the Word of God. Because experiences do matter. Amen. Because we do have to discern. And so we taught about the apostles' doctrine we taught about what that was, repentance, baptism in Jesus' name, the infilling of the Holy Ghost, speaking in tongues. And we read the scriptures regarding that. It's on the note sheet. We read all the scriptures about doctrine mattering and, and how important they are. Take heed to thyself and unto the doctrine, because in doing so, 1 Timothy 4.16, thou shalt both save thyself and those that hear thee, along with many other scriptures and how important they were. And then we talked about what does the scriptures say further about doctrine and truth, and we read 11 things, 11 scriptures, and some really, really great things in how we need to love and cherish truth. And so where we ended up, and where we're going to do it today, is we ended up with this page where we're taking uh, 14 names that describe beliefs. Some of these, or many of these, we would call denominations, and we're going to examine each of them and see what it is according to Scripture, that they match or they do not match. And so we start with the Catholic Church. The, the Catholic Church, now, I'm going to say two things about this as a preface. Number one, in each of these denominations, there are always groups within them who do not believe exactly the same. For example, how many know there are some Catholics who believe in the Holy Ghost, speaking in tongues? There's Catholics like that. So, number two, we said this last Thursday. There are many people on this list of denominations who love God just like you do, just like I do. They are just not in full counsel of truth yet in their life. God hopefully is going to keep bringing them, and they have to choose to accept or reject that truth. So I want you to understand that uh, about each of these. So this is not an indictment on individual people. This is, make no mistake about it, this is an indictment on belief systems. The belief system 
of the Catholic Church, I'm attacking that when I do this tonight. I'm coming strong against it, and here's why. I can't cover anything and everything of each of these, so I'm highlighting some of the major things that I can talk about in our time. You know, I don't have you here for five hours. The Catholic Church baptizes, and we talk, let me, let me say this, because I want to talk about baptism a lot tonight. Pretty much every one of these denominations as a system or ideology, they do not baptize according to what's written in the Bible. And the reason that's important is because baptism is a part of our redemption. Many of these churches teach it's an, it's an outward uh, sign or example of an inward act of God. Well, the Bible doesn't say that anywhere, number one. It's true it is. It's not a bad statement. But it's a denominal statement that's not written in Scripture. Here is what's written in Scripture. We are buried with Christ in baptism. We put on Christ in baptism. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Here doth now also baptism now save us. See, baptism is part of our redemption. Why? Because it's part of the gospel. If you understand what the gospel really is, the gospel is Jesus. And Jesus is the death, burial, and resurrection. That's 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. The gospel is death, burial, resurrection. The gospel is blood, water, spirit. Here, I'll get real good with you. The gospel is the altar of sacrifice, the water laver, and the holiest of holies. And to make it real clear in Scripture, when you really understand the Bible, the gospel is now repentance, baptism in Jesus' name, and the infilling of the Holy Ghost. See, if you don't still get that or agree with that, you don't know the Bible good enough yet. You need to let me come sit with you and show you the Scripture and just repeatedly see what the Bible says until the Lord gives you the understanding because you get all the Scriptures in your mind together at once. Some people get three Scriptures. That's all they can see. And so they, 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 they hear, but they can't understand. And so we understand that the Scriptures, all of them speak. And so when it comes to baptism, when it comes to, to, well, pastor, Romans 10 and 9, the Bible says, uh, confession of the mouth is made unto salvation. Isn't that salvation what you say just with your mouth? The answer is, I believe that 100%. And I also believe you better repent too. And I also believe you better get baptized in Jesus' name too. Why? Because I got a bunch of scripture that says that too. See, it all counts. What I don't understand with these denominations is why they highlight a couple scriptures and all the other scriptures that I can quote off the top of my head like they don't matter. We take the full counsel of the Word of God. That's how we easily disprove what is error and what is truth. And so when it, that's why when I talk about baptism, baptism is part of redemption. It's part of our burial. It's, it's part of being planted together in his likeness. When you start reading all the Bible verses on what baptism means, these churches don't have a clue. It's some sin. No, no, it's very important to God. And that's why we got to do it the way he says it. So the Catholic Church, they baptize by sprinkling. That's not biblical. They baptize by pouring. Or, and also, they baptize babies. Let me do this. I'm going to go, I'm going to put them all up here. And then I'm going to the next screen. There we go. Baptizing babies is not in the Bible anywhere. It's wrong. It means nothing. It, there's no salvation in baptizing a baby. There's no anything in baptizing a baby. It's basically you gave a bath to a baby. How many understand that? That's just Bible. There, there, there's no scripture for it. It's a tradition of men, a commandment of men, invented by men, never by God. Secondly, the Catholic Church baptizes in the titles the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. So they repeat what Jesus said in Matthew 28, 19, and they never obey it. It's like me saying to Brother Denny Youngsma, Brother Denny, Go out to the church sign and paint the pastor's name on the church sign. I come to church Sunday, and Brother Denny has painted on the church sign the pastor's name. You find that humorous. Why? Because it's obvious the mistake he made, right? He repeated what I said. He didn't obey what I said. So what would I say to Brother Denny? I would say, Brother Denny, 
Why did you put that on there? Because you said paint the pastor's name on the sign. So I put the pastor's name. And I would say, Danny, I thought you had the common sense to know what my name was. In other words, if you ever called me by my name, you would never in a million years say pastor, father, son, right? Husband. You would, that, that's who I am. That's my titles. That's my roles. That's my function. That's my manifestation. But my name is Scott. So if he did what I said and obeyed it, he would put Scott Shelby, right? So many of these denominations, including the Catholic Church, they repeat the command. They do not obey the command. And someone has said to me before, does that really matter if their intent was right? My answer is this. What's so difficult about just doing what it says? I mean, is it really that hard? See, listen, there's a spirit behind that. There's an error and a pride in that spirit of not doing it in Jesus' name. Satan hates the name of Jesus. No one cast a devil out in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. And no one got baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. That's not in the Bible anywhere. It's done every single time in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. So my answer always to that question is, what's so hard just about doing it? Why not just do it? Are you following me, church? Are you, are you following me online? How simple is it just to do it? Why would anybody ever risk such a thing? I don't understand it. I'm not God. I don't know absolutely all the answers. I just know God got technical in the scriptures. Hey, Noah, I want you to make an ark. Here's how I want you to make it exactly. And here's, the, how many know there's different types of wood you could use to build something? Noah, go for wood. Go for wood. Hey, Cain, Abel, build an altar and worship me. It's pretty religious. It's pretty good, worshiping God. Take the best of what you got. They take the best. Hey, Cain, I don't receive this. Wait a minute, I worshiped? Wait a minute, I built an altar? Wait a minute, I gave you my best. And God comes, nope, do it again and do it right. Is that Bible or not? That's Bible. Well, Pastor, you did. It's not me. Your, your, your argument's not with me. Anyone's argument at home, it's not with me. Your argument is show me one place where anybody was baptized any other way after Jesus resurrected than the name of Jesus Christ. Show me. And so, my, my answer always is why are you so stubborn? Why won't you just do what the Bible said? What's with all the questions? Once God shows you that truth, just do it. Acts 19, they got baptized. They were baptized by immersion. And the Bible comes along and Paul finds out they weren't baptized in Jesus' name. You ever read it? Acts 19, 1 through 6, they were believers. They were disciples. They weren't sinners. They were church folk. And Paul found out, and the Bible says he commanded them, and they didn't sit there and have an argument. They didn't sit there and say, now, wait a minute. We all, right. no, 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 the Bible says they got baptized. That's precious. Once you hear truth, do it. Well, the Catholic Church, they baptize in titles. The Catholic Church prays to dead saints. Yeah, we already talked about sprinkling bishop and porn. They pray to dead saints. They pray to Mary. That's the sin of idolatry, one of the Ten Commandments. Because you can't pray to humans, other humans besides Jesus Christ who was a human. God in the flesh, we only pray to him. They believe in purgatory, which is a place of purification of sin before you go to heaven. There's one problem with purgatory. It's not in the Bible anywhere. It's not written anywhere. <laughs> Anyone following the trend on this one? The Catholic Church is the biggest cult in the world. They're the biggest cult in the world. They're teaching a bunch of nonsense that's not written in the Bible. So that's why, and one more thing. I, I, mean, I could keep going on this, by the way. No holiness, which I find common in many of these right here. Holiness is separation of the world. 
Holiness is, hey, we draw lines and we don't do those things the wrong. If we, if we do them and we make a mistake, we repent and we get back on the right pathway because we're not perfect. But we have holiness. We, we say, hey, we draw lines when it comes to the way we speak, when it comes to the things we watch, when it comes to the things we wear. Hey, ladies, when it comes to jewelry and makeup and all those things and showing your cleavage, are you hearing me? There's some lines in the scripture. They're not, they're not Anchor Church. They're not Pastor Scott. If you say you're following God, you need to learn what the word says about that stuff. Because if I'm a good pastor, I'm not going to ignore it. That's why I just said it just now. It's in the Bible. You have a responsibility that if you're going to obey God and follow God, that you're going to say, hey, I'm going to draw some lines of holiness, not just on inward things, but outward things. It's no secret to anybody here. This world is built on sensuality of the female body right now. Go look at advertisements everywhere. Go look at social media and look at these teenage girls and 20-something girls who all they're doing, they want to show their bodies off. Why? Because they get followers and they make money off it. Oh, I'm just speaking real. And I'm speaking raw. But if you're going to follow Jesus, this ain't following Anchor Church and this ain't following Pastor Christ, Scott. This is following, are you going to follow Jesus or not? Then you got to draw some lines. Amen. Hey, guys, it's not okay to cuss and swear. It's not. All right. You get the point. All right. So, they disappear from the screen because they don't follow the scriptures that it's written in the Word of God. All right, let's go to the Baptist church. The Baptist church. The Baptist church does not believe in speaking in tongues. They're very strong against speaking in tongues. Now, we're look at me because I'm going to talk for just a moment. The reason they believe that it's wrong is they say that according to 1 Corinthians 13, as there's one scripture that is used, and there's a number of denominations on the screen that say the same thing about this. They don't believe in speaking in tongues because they say speaking in tongues was for the apostles' day, and that's it. No one else was to speak in tongues besides them. Well, I, I personally have a fundamental problem with that because that means they're calling me a liar. They're saying I'm a faker because I've spoken in tongues since I was nine years old. So I have a problem with it because that makes me a liar or a faker or... I'm right, and it's not me that's right. It's the Holy Scriptures that are right. So who's right and what's right? Well, when you go in Scripture, Acts 2, 38, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, verse 39, for this promise. How many know what the promise is? Luke 24, the promise of the Father, which is the Holy Ghost. You find that in the Bible. And Jesus talked about it, and then Peter spoke it in obedience a few weeks later. For the promise of the, for the, this promise rather, is given unto you, your children. Well, that makes the Baptist wrong automatically. And all, it's talking about the promise, the Holy Ghost. And all that are afar off. Even, now listen, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And here's another problem. You get in, and, and, and there's, there's so many layers to this. You get into 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and then 14 and talking about the gifts of the Spirit and the gift of tongues. Obviously, in the Corinthian church, many decades later, you got people speaking in tongues still. Even after some of the apostles have died and they're no longer there, you got people speaking in tongues. So, when the Baptists say, well, tongues shall cease... In 1 Corinthians 13, that exact same verse right next to that says this, knowledge shall be done away with or shall cease. Now, let me ask a question everybody in this room. Has knowledge been done away with yet? No, of course not. Of course not. So tongues have not been done away with. And the Apostle Paul at the end of chapter 14, he ends it by saying, forbid not to speak with tongues. Here's the second problem that many of these denominal churches have with speaking in tongues. We teach according to the scriptures, and I could sit down with you for 30 minutes and show you without any ounce of any doubt whatsoever, if you say this is your authority, that when you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, how do you know? 
Well, Acts 2.36 tells us it's something you can see, it's something you can hear. What does the scriptures teach they saw and they heard? We know, of course, speaking in tongues. And then we know further into Acts chapter uh, 8 that Simon the sorcerer, that they had prayed for the Holy Ghost. They had repented. They had miracles in Acts chapter number 8 with Philip. They had great joy in the city. They were believers. They had repented. They had been baptized. They had done everything right, but no one received the Holy Ghost. The Bible says that. Not me. The Bible says that. Only the Holy Ghost had fell upon none of them. So they sent for Peter and John, who, when they had come, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. And the Bible says that when they laid their hands upon them, they received the Holy Ghost. And the Bible says that when Simon the sorcerer saw that the Holy Ghost was given by the laying on of hands, he offered them money, saying, Give me that like same gift that whosoever I may lay hands on may also receive the Holy Ghost. And they look at him and simply say, Dude... No, that's not the Bible. But, dude, let your money perish with you. The gift of God is not about money, man. <laughs> In other words, he didn't get it. He was clueless what was taking place. So, but what I'm trying to teach you is, obviously, it was a separate, distinct experience from believing and from repenting and from baptism. All these denominal churches teach that you are filled with the Spirit when you believe on Jesus Christ. Show me where that's written in the Bible. Show me. It's, all, it's said by all of them. Show me where, though. I know the Bible. It's not in there. It's not written anywhere. You know what I can show you? I can show you that you are filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and the initial evidence, tongues, is not the Holy Ghost. It's the evidence that God has done a supernatural act upon you. You will speak in tongues as the Spirit gives the utterance. And it may be two words, five words, ten words, a hundred words, a thousand words. And you may not know, have, there's, there's a heavenly language, there's a language of men, and there's a language of angels, the Bible teaches those things. You're not going to know what you're saying. It may come out like baby language the very first time, like it did for me. But thank God it happened. And now when I speak in tongues, you know when I speak in tongues. The point I'm making to you is when you go and read the scripture in Acts chapter 10 at Cornelius' house and Acts chapter 19 with those that have been baptized, you find both places showing us very clearly that when they had laid hands upon, they received the Holy Ghost. Verse 47, Acts chapter number 10, and I think it's verse 48. For they heard them speak with tongues. Hey, Peter, how do you know Cornelius' house just got the Holy Ghost? Because they heard him speak with tongues. It was an initial sign or evidence, just like it's always been in Scripture. I can show you multiple examples of that's how it happens. See, I'm just teaching what's written in the Bible. The Baptist church is against that. So for me, that means they're against what's written in the Bible. And so that right away eliminates them for me. Because... The scriptures are clear about receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And some people, you know, well, you, you mean, I don't got the Holy Spirit. I'm not filled with the Spirit. I have filled the Spirit. Folks, where do we start? Not with your feelings, not with your opinions, not with your beliefs. Where do we start? I'm asking you, where do we start? We start with what's written. And then we add to what's written. We don't do it the other way. That's how you get error. When I can clearly sit down with anybody in this room or in the world and show you in 30 minutes a more in-depth teaching of what I just said in the Bible, and, and, and listen closely. Here's what a lot of these churches teach. They teach, well, speaking in tongues is not for everybody. They believe in tongues, but they don't believe it's for everybody. They say, no, the Bible clearly states not all speak with tongues. The Bible does say that. Where does it say that at? 1 Corinthians 14. What's the context of 1 Corinthians 14? The gifts of the Spirit. There's nine of them. Everybody does not have the gift of faith. Everybody does not have the gift of healing. Everybody does not have the gift of prophecy. Everybody does not have the gift of speaking in tongues or the gift of interpretation of tongues. Is that true? That's true. Everybody does not speak in tongues as one of the nine gifts of the Spirit. God divides them severally as he will. So everybody's not used in all the night. There's gifts I'm not used in. Some I am used in. It's just the way it works. We let God figure that out. 
So the ultimate question is, well, wait a minute, Pastor. If the Bible says not all speak with tongues, and you get into that chapter 14 and read about that, then how are you saying what you're saying? Because that's referring to the gift of tongues. The whole chapter is about the gifts of the Spirit, and it's referring to they were misusing and abusing the gift of tongues, and there was confusion in the church. When you read the context, how do you know? It's real simple. First of all, Paul said, at, let at most be two or three that speak. Well, all I got to do, first of all, is go to Acts chapter number two. It wasn't 12 apostles in the upper room. How many were in the upper room? 120. They all spoke with tongues. There was no gift of tongues. There were those there on the streets that understood them, but there was not an interpretation given according to 1 Corinthians 14. When you go to Cornelius' house, that's more than two. When you go to Acts 19, that's more than two or three. When you go to Acts 8, it's a whole city. Are you following me? See, in the Bible, when people receive the Holy Ghost as the baptism of the Spirit, they always spoke with tongues. Always. It's the initial evidence and sign that God's performed a supernatural act. Well, then, Pastor, why doesn't everybody receive it that way? Because people don't believe that and people don't seek that. And why don't they? Because of pride. That's the biggest issue. It's prideful. There's no shame because someone has never spoken in tongues. I was, I give my life to the Lord and went a couple years. I never spoke in tongues. So first of all, for everybody in this room, if you're watching online, there's no shame because you've never spoken in tongues or I've only spoken in tongues once. Or, there's no shame in that. The shame is when you don't do your part. What's your part? You got to believe. You got to repent. You got to get baptized. God can't make you do anything. The outpouring of the Holy Ghost, that's his. Our job is to be open vessels. Our job is to say, here I am. Our job is to take the lid off. Oh, come on, somebody. Uh -huh. Our job is to say, Lord, I want it. That's in the book of Luke. He loves to give the Holy Ghost to them that ask for it. You ever read it? So our job is say, I'm going to come to the altar, and I'm going to pour my heart out to God. And if it happens, great. I want it. If it don't, great. I got blessed. You see, it's a win-win. You can't lose. So that's why don't get depressed. Don't get full of shame. Don't, well, I didn't speak in tongues today, and I want to have that. Hey, you just seek God, and God will take care of it. And when God, it's his to pour out, not mine, not yours, not anybody's. We just got to reach for it and let him do it. Are you understanding? The Baptist church does not believe in speaking in tongues that way. If you want more understanding, by the way, on that lesson, I'm going to teach a whole lesson on a Sunday morning about that down the road. But I'd be more than willing for anybody. I'll come hang out with you. We'll go out to eat somewhere. We'll go, I'll come to your house. We'll come here. Whatever. Just say, Pastor, I want to get with you. My life is to do this. So I'll, I'll teach you more. I'll show you in the Bible. And I'll help you understand better. Number two, the Baptist church believes in eternal security. All that means is the Baptist church believes once you're saved, you're always saved. They use certain scriptures for that. I did a whole teaching last year on that subject. So there's a whole teaching on that that I've done. I do have note sheets for that. If you want it, let me know, and I'll email it to you. The Bible nowhere teaches once saved, always saved. Some of the scriptures they use is, you know, once you can't be plucked out of the Father's hand, that has nothing to do with it. I can go to parable there's, there's definitely two huge ones where the Bible says the believers is appointed their portion with the unbelievers where there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. In the scriptures, the only place that's written where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth is the lake of fire. It's hell. Okay? So it shows right there in two different places that believers can be appointed with unbelievers for eternity in the lake of fire. That's Bible. There's, you can't argue that. That's why I sat down with a, chapel, a chaplain one time, and he raised that issue with me. And I said, read this. Evidently, he don't read the Bible or the whole thing. Because when he read it for 20 minutes, he never looked up. He never said a word. It was awkward, too. It was, it was just silent because you could tell. He was, it, was, it was like I was a boxer. 
hit him three times in the face with a jab, and he didn't know what to do. Are you, do you see what I'm trying to say to you? In other words, light hit him, and evidently he didn't, had never read that, and he was shocked by it. He didn't know what to say back to me, because you can't. You can't argue what's written. And so there's plenty of other scripture. I, I taught on that. If you want the teaching, I'll, I'll print the notes for you or email them to you and give them to you. And uh, you can see in scripture, there's so many verses that refer and, and give us the absolute understanding that once you're saved, you're not always saved. That's a false teaching, eternal security. Most Baptist churches, not all on this one, but most Baptist churches have no holiness these days. In the old days, that wasn't true. But these days, most Baptist churches have no holiness at all, no separation unto the Lord. Now, people will say they're separated. They're not according to the written scriptures at all. And let me add this about the Baptist church and a number of other these denominations. They, they baptize in the titles, not the name of Jesus Christ. There's many in the Christian denominal world, and here's what they teach. They teach you don't have to be literally baptized in the name of Jesus Christ because here's what they say. They say all that meant was to be baptized in the authority of Jesus and that you don't need to literally call out the name of Jesus and thus baptism in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost is acceptable. There's one problem with that. It's not in here. There's nowhere. I go online and have fun with people. I'm really trying to help them honestly, but I have fun with people. And all these scholars on, online who think they know the Bible and they want to argue with me about these things, I've dealt with all these issues online. And I always come with Scripture and I reply with Scripture and I say, show me in chapter and verse where that's at. See, everything I teach and believe, I can show you with chapter and verse. And I can confirm it with more than one. Here's the problem with that teaching. I've never had one person yet show me in chapter and verse where the Bible says that. You want to know why? Because it's not written in the Bible. There's no where it says in the authority of Jesus Christ when you're baptized and follow. It's not in the Bible. Are you following me? So, are you following me? Are you getting this? So, we have to remove the Baptist church. We don't follow the Baptist church because they don't teach truth. They don't teach the full counsel of Scripture. Now, here's, here's the thing. They believe in Jesus, but they, they're not believing in what's written in the Bible about Jesus because if they did, they would do what we're, we're teaching and saying. The Methodist Church. How many have heard of the Methodist Church? And we'll start going quicker now. They don't believe in speaking in tongues because some of this gets repetitive. They baptize by sprinkling or pouring, which is not biblical. They also baptize by immersion. You get to choose. That's not biblical either. Well, you do whatever you want to do. No, that's not what the Bible says. And baptize in the titles. We already taught on that. On the, not the name of Jesus Christ. There's no holiness in most Methodist churches. And there's been a split the last few years where many of the Methodist churches now, they allow for gay marriage and gay ministers. Well, the Bible is pretty clear about that one. I don't even got to talk about that. There's plenty of places in the Bible where I can show you it's an abomination to God. It's a sin. It's wrong. We love the sin or, or love the sinner, hate the sin, and it's a, that's simple. Well, here's the problem. A lot of these up here are starting to give in to all this stuff. You want to know why? Because when you stray from what's written in the Word of God, you lose your way. You become blind to truth. So we have to remove the Methodist church because they don't follow what's written in the Bible. Do they believe in Jesus? Yes, they say they do. But Galatians chapter 1, that if you don't believe in the gospel as it's written, let you be accursed. If anyone come unto you and teach you any other gospel, then we have already taught unto you, let him be accursed. Galatians chapter 1. There's only one gospel, there's only one way, there's only one apostle's doctrine, one God. Jehovah's Witnesses, how many have heard of them? Have they ever knocked on anybody's door? Whose door have they knocked on besides mine? A number of you. Okay. The Jehovah's Witnesses. You now it's going to start getting bizarre. They baptize in the titles, not the name of Jesus Christ. Are you following that? That's the commonality of all these people. They, and by the way, they all say that we're the weirdos. They say we're the heretics. Do you know that? Don't believe everything you read on Google, by the way. 
I read, I read stuff on there that talk about what's supposed to be I believe, and I read that, and I say to myself, dude, you don't have a clue what I believe. So they all say we're heretics because we don't believe in the Trinity. We believe that there's one God and one person of God. Well, I got way more Bible than anyone else has that believes the other way on that issue. And here's the other problem with that. You, can, you don't got to be a Bible scholar to be saved, by the way. Everyone hear me real good. You don't got to be a Bible scholar to be saved. You don't have to understand everything about what I'm teaching and the Bible says to be saved. You just got to obey it. And here's the problem with the other side of that coin is I know we, I, us, we've obeyed, and we, we're Peter, we're Paul, we did exactly as they did and what they did. The other side, they have not, and they cannot contend with that. When you say those things, besides all the other stuff that's false, just that in itself, okay, let's argue about that, let's discuss that, but have you been baptized in Jesus' name like they did in the Bible? Are you following me? See, that's the problem. So they deny, now here's a big issue. The Jehovah's Witnesses, they deny the deity of Jesus Christ. They don't believe Jesus Christ was God. We do. We believe, and that's where we agree with those who say they're Trinitarian, we all believe that Jesus was God in the flesh. They believe that Jesus was the archangel Michael. There's one problem with that. Guess what it is? What's the problem with that? It's not written. It's not in the Word. Thank you, Frida. Do you see the, the commonality? It's not here anywhere. That's why when you start talking with Jehovah's Witnesses, if you know what you're talking about, you can stump them real fast because they believe some nonsense. They believe he is the Son of God, as the Bible says, but they do not believe that he is God in the flesh. So they do not worship Jesus as they do not believe that he is Almighty God. We do. And they believe that when you die, your body and your soul ceases to exist, and they don't believe in hell, and they also believe that only 144,000 in the book of Revelation, they believe they're the only ones that go to heaven. Here's one problem with those teachings. Guess what it is? Here, let's all do it together. It's not written. Here, one more time. It's not written. You're going to find this in every one of these. It's just, it's just not there. It's a tradition of men. It's a, it's a commandment of men. And the, I, I, I'm stumped as to why people get so deceived by this stuff. So guess what? We can't be Jehovah's Witness. Pentecostal Trinitarians, they believe in the Holy Ghost like we do. They believe in speaking in tongues like we do. In most cases, they do not believe in holiness like we do. They believe you can do what you want as far as the way you look and the way you dress. Uh, most of their women look like clowns. All you got to do is turn on TBN, the religious channel. You want to see some women that look like clowns? I'm not joking. I'm being dead serious. They are so painted up with makeup. When you start coloring your face and your eyes and your lips and your whatever, there's only one thing in the Bible that talks about that. You know what it is? The whore and the prostitute. And it was used to seduce. The Bible says that when you're a woman of God, you are to adorn yourself as a woman professing godliness. You ever read it? It said, don't let it be that outward stuff. Nothing wrong with a woman wanting to be attractive, by the way. God made you that way. The difference between wanting to be attractive and wanting to be seductive is where the written word comes in. Nothing wrong with a woman wanting to be attractive. God made you as a female to be pretty and to be attractive. It's wrong when a woman wants to be seductive. You follow me, women? And that's a whole teaching in itself. But that's where I have a big issue, the Pentecostal Trinitarians, is they don't want to talk about that stuff. They baptize in the titles, not the name of Jesus Christ, same thing as all the others. And uh, so for those two main issues are what they are. And for those two things, I've got too much written scripture that convicts my heart to say, well, I can't be Pentecostal Trinitarian. So that's got to go. Lutheran. How many heard of the Lutherans? The Lutherans baptized by sprinkling or pouring. They baptize babies. 
They baptize in the titles, not the name of Jesus Christ. They don't believe in speaking in tongues. They believe in eternal security. So check, 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 check. There is no holiness in the Lutheran church. And they allow for gay marriage and they allow for gay ministers. The Lutheran church has lost its way. There's seven things, I think, there. And I got seven things written that say the opposite of all that. So we have to remove the Lutheran church. Not truth. The Presbyterian church. They baptize by sprinkling, pouring, or immersion. They baptize in the titles, not the name of Jesus Christ. They don't believe in speaking in tongues. There's no holiness. They accept gay marriage and homosexuality, even ordaining homosexuals as ministers. And that's all happened the last five years. They've lost their way. So, again, the Presbyterian Church, you know, how many are seeing the commonality of all these denominations? It's just a litany of a list, and they all, and, and, and I could be here with you for hours, but they're not teaching what's written in the Bible. So we remove the Presbyterian Church. I'm going to keep going real fast here. The Episco how many have heard of the Episcopalian Church? Kind of like Catholics a little bit. They baptize by sprinkling or pouring, and they baptize babies. They baptize in titles, not the name of Jesus Christ. They don't believe in speaking in tongues, no holiness, and accepting of homosexuality and gay marriage. Do you see the trend here? When you don't walk in truth, you eventually accept abominations. Are you seeing that? It's crazy. So, the Episcopalian Church does not follow the Scriptures. You can say you believe in Jesus all you want. you got to do what's written. Amen, church? All right, let's do the Mormons. The Mormons don't think Jesus is God, but that he's a... No, this is going to get crazy. Wait till you hear this stuff. They don't think Jesus is God. And by the way, there's a lot of good people up on that screen. A lot of good Mormons, a lot of good Jehovah's Witnesses, by the way. Good people. Don't think Jesus is God but that he's a separate God created by God. And salvation doesn't just save us, but that we can become gods ourselves. And they believe God used to be a man. God formerly was a man. According to Mormonism, anyone who does not or did not have a chance to accept Mormonism may do so in the spirit world after physical death. What's the problem with all of that? Let me hear everybody. It's not written. It's not no, is, is this pretty easy, right? I mean, you can get an A plus on this if you're in school right now. It's so easy, true or false. I mean, it's so easy. So here's the question. Why are so many millions of people deceived by all these denominations and religions? Why? The devil, their spirits. And the God of this world has blinded the mind of them who would believe. There's blindness in them. They really believe what they believe. They're blind. Also, the Mormons baptize in titles, not the name of Jesus Christ. So, can't be a Mormon. The United Church of Christ, they baptize by sprinkling or pouring, and they baptize babies. They baptize in titles, not the name of Jesus Christ. They do not believe in speaking in tongues. And they accept gay marriage and homosexuality. And there's no holiness of following that in their church whatsoever. By the way, they're huge proponents of gay marriage and gay clergy. Can't be not in the church of Christ. They don't follow what's written in the Bible. The Nazarenes. They baptize by sprinkling or pouring and immersion also. And now, by immersion, by the way, is the correct way in the scripture. But pouring or sprinkling is not. But they let you choose. They also baptize babies. They baptize in titles, not the name of Jesus Christ. They don't believe in speaking in tongues, and there's no holiness in the Nazarene church. I had three families who were Nazarene that I've pastored years back who we won out of the Nazarene church. I had to go to their apartment once a week for months and teach them truth to get them to unwind from a lack of understanding of what the Bible says. Because they were conditioned to believe certain things. And they had to read it for themselves. So the Nazarene church, just like all the others, they don't follow what's written in the Bible, so we can't be Nazarene. can't follow that. How many heard of Seventh-day Adventist? 
They're the ones that believe you've got to go to church on Saturday only. You can't go to church on Sunday. They baptize. Guess how? In the titles of the of Fathers and Holy Ghost, not in the name of Jesus Christ. There is no holiness. They don't believe in speaking in tongues. They believe you must attend church on Saturday because that's the Sabbath day. I don't got time to teach that, but that's foolishness. It's nonsense. It's so easily to disprove in the Bible. So the seventh day of Venice, we can't follow that for one reason. Why? It's not written. That stuff's not written in the Bible. Y'all remove them. Charismatic Trinitarians. I have friends who are charismatic and who borderline on Trinitarian or there is one God, one person, and all that. They believe in speaking in tongues and the Holy Ghost, but they baptize in titles, not the name of Jesus Christ. There's no holiness. I, I know some folks and some things and people and churches and and here's the problem with that. Who am I talking about when I say the Charismatic Trinitarian Church? Well, I'll give you an example. Who knows who Benny Hinn is? You know who Benny Hinn is? Benny Hinn's the guy. Just go watch TV, go YouTube it, and he goes. And the whole church goes. And Benny Hinn takes his coat, and he pulls it off, and he walks around, and he goes. And everybody goes. I'm not joking, by the way. I'm not, if you've watched, how many know what I'm talking about? I am not joking one ounce. It's like, it's like I'm watching Ultraman from 1978 on TV. And I'm going, Crazy. Overly dramatic. Here's the problem with that. It's, in my opinion, demonic. Hey, I believe in miracles. I believe in the supernatural. I do. I, I believe in the gifts of the Spirit. I, 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 believe the, I believe in emotion. I believe we can be passionate, emotional. Hey, I've had times in my life, I've ran around the church, I've jumped up and down. I have fell out in the Spirit, truthfully. It was real. I believe in some of that. Man, they go to a point that is unscriptural. It gets crazy to the point where it is what the Bible calls, it's acts of the flesh. And that's, that's a fine line because it's in your flesh that you must worship. But charismatic Trinitarians baptize in titles, not the name of Jesus Christ. Now, here's a, here's a little thing about that. There are a lot of charismatic Trinitarians who do baptize in Jesus' name, by the way. So when I say that, it's, it's really mixed in that group. There's a lot who are baptizing in Jesus' name, they won't baptize Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. In fact, Bishop, how many know Happy Gospel Church over on State Road 70? Pastor Bailey, I worked at the radio station there years ago, but Bishop taught him and showed him in the scripture many, many, many years ago. And Pastor Bailey, his wife, family, they all got rebaptized in Jesus' name. The pastor. Isn't that pretty cool? He got baptized and he taught his whole church and said, You need to get rebaptized in Jesus' name. He got the truth. He understood it. There's a, there's a lot that do baptize according to what's written in the Bible. But there's a lot that do not. Uh, they believe in the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues, but they, they take all that to such an extreme level that it becomes, and, and this is where it is, it becomes fake. It, it really does. It becomes so dramatic that it becomes fake. I, I, I mean, I believe God can do crazy and, and miraculous things, but I've watched way too much of that, and I, I've been a part of some things, and I'm sorry, but brother, it's your bad breath making the people fall out, not your power. I'm joking, by the way. But it, So we cannot follow the charismatic Trinitarians. They don't follow written scripture in too many places. And by the way, their women look like clowns too. Uh, again, just go on YouTube or TV and go watch how they adorn themselves. Nothing wrong with a woman being attractive, but when you start looking like a clown, some of you women need to get that. You're going to follow God or not? You're going to follow churches? You're going to follow a preacher? Are you going to follow the scriptures? Amen. I need some ladies to say, Amen. That's Bible. That's not Pastor Scott. That's not Anchor Church. That's Bible. You got to learn what the scriptures teach. It's been lost. That's why they're now, all these churches, hey, by the way, the bishop will tell you this. Uh, is, am I not right that some of these churches, the Methodists, the Baptists, the Presbyterians, they used to have the move of the Holy Ghost 50 and 60 years ago. Did they not? 
They did. And when they lost all that, it took a few decades, but now look where they're at. They're embracing abominations of God. Do you see that? See, that's what happens when you lose those first things. That's why we draw lines. All right, that leaves us at the apostolic church. I call myself, now there are different types, if you go on Google, of apostolic. There are some, I don't believe what they believe. But the fundamental teaching of the apostolic church is why I say if someone were to ask me, I don't like denominational names at all. I don't like them at all. So that's why I say apostolic is not a denomination. Apostolic is a way. It's the way of truth. It's the apostles doctrine. That's where the, the word apostolic. It's the way of the apostles, the apostles doctrine. I got scripture for that. The apostolic church, I, mean, I call myself apostolic. What does the church believe? And I'll talk about what we believe because that's what we are. We baptize in the name of Jesus Christ just like it's written and just like the apostles did in the original church. So, number one, good for me. Number two, we believe in the baptism of the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues just like the apostles did in the original church. For me, check number two. I did a short teaching about gift of tongues and the difference and all that stuff. But for me, that's just an easy thing when you really understand the Bible there. Number three, we believe in holiness and separation from this world just like the apostles did as it's written in the original church. We believe that. That makes us unpopular with some people. Some people don't want to stay in a church like that. Why? Because they're led by their flesh. Oh, I want the spirit. Oh, but don't tell me how to live. I got to be careful here. I know of, of, of a woman in the last week who said, I don't want anybody telling me how to live. You know whose spirit that is? Who can guess? Jezebel. That's the spirit of the modern woman in America right now. No one going to be in charge of me. I'm gonna, it's the feminist spirit. Now, first of all, no woman should be abused. No woman is required by Scripture to follow a parked car. Did all the women get that? You're not required to follow a parked car. In other words, you're not required to follow a man who ain't doing anything, ain't moving anywhere, and ain't obeying the Scripture. Paul said, simply follow me as I follow Christ. Hey, I'll follow you, but when you start doing things that aren't scriptural and they're against God's principles and they're cursing our family, I ain't got to follow you no more. Do you hear me, women? If you're getting abused, if you're getting beat, if you're getting whatever, you're not required by Bible to follow a man who's trying to beat you up. That's a whole other teaching. But the Jezebel spirit... That's a whole nother thing. And so we say to our women, hey, do not participate in that devilish, demonic spirit. And that's a whole teaching in the Bible. Separate yourself from the way this world believes about the way a woman's supposed to be. And get in what the Bible says. Go read Proverbs 31. Go read the epistles where the Bible talks about the woman. And say, okay, that's who I want to be. Who? A woman. Now listen. A woman. In fact, when it comes to dress and adornment, this is so important. No churches, they don't want to teach on this stuff. It's all Bible. I want to be a woman and I want to be whatever. The Bible says I'm going to be as that which be, I dress as that or adorn myself as that which becometh a woman. That professes godliness. What's that mean? Modesty. Here's the problem with that word. The Bible don't give you a list. It gives you principles. So we got to be careful. And, well, okay, pastor, what is modest? Here's what I say. Common sense. It's all adults in here, right? There's no kids. Is there any kids? If they are, are they sleeping? Okay. That means this, women. You don't show your boobs off. You don't show your butt off. Are you hearing me? You can be attractive without being seductive. 
You follow me? I'm just being raw and I'm being real. There's a part of the church world today and the world in general that does not want to teach these simple, absolute principles written in the Scripture. I am apostolic because that's what we teach. When we bring all our girls to a youth conference in St. Louis and there's 36,000 young people mainly there, there's some adults as chaperones and some adults there, but mainly it's youth. You know what our youth go there and see? They see a bunch of girls and young ladies who are dressed like females and they're dressed modestly. That's why your boys also and your girls need to go to the youth things we go to like that. Why? They need to see this is way bigger than just this building. There's thousands upon millions in the whole world that believe just like this. And they need to see how big that is and how many people are trying to live just like them, trying to, like we teach and say, hey, you don't need to do that stuff. Let's stand. We believe in holiness. We believe that you don't, so don't, listen, listen. We don't believe you listen to any kind of music you want to listen to. We don't believe that you can just watch any kind of movie you want to watch. You follow me? Yeah. Teach your kids that. Because this world through Hollywood will steal your kid's head. We don't allow them to do whatever they want on social media. Huh? Huh? There's got to be some lines, and we got to draw them. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the patience of your people, for those that have watched this online, for those that are here in the church watching and hearing and listening to this. I pray for revelation. I pray according to the scriptures that you would open their minds, help them to see, help them to know what truth is, and that we say, hey, I'm apostolic, not because of a de denomination, because it's just what we believe as it's written in the scriptures. We follow the apostles' doctrine. Help us to do it because it's right. It's written, and it's the word of God. In Jesus' name we pray, and everyone said amen. Amen. All right, we're dismissing. They're going to be bringing the stuff in. Some of you younger guys too, Anthony, David, Nathan, you know, uh, uh, help, us, help us out a little bit as they bring these chairs in, kind of help get it situated in the middle there.